Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill's World Bible School, and welcome to Friday Morning Conversations. Uh, thank you, Carol Anderson, and for others who are joining in with me this morning. So uh, this show is about, uh, if you want, get your Bible, get your notebook, get a cup of coffee or uh, uh, hot chocolate or uh, hot tea or whatever you like to drink in the mornings or wherever you are, whatever time of the day it is there. And we're going to get started this morning because I've got a powerful lesson that I'm going to share with you this morning. And again, we still are waiting on Facebook to respond to our webinar system so that they can get joined up and we'll be able to broadcast and have guests back on our show again, as we did before. So such an exciting time to be living. Amen. So we're going to talk about provision minded versus provider minded provision minded versus provider minded and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun this morning okay now one thing many people are hard pressed about in their thinking is the provision factor we all need provision from time to time isn't that right uh, we all know that it takes money to survive in this life I mean, it would be very difficult for you to survive for all practical intents and purposes in this life without any type of monetary in, uh, intake into your life. However, when our focus is on money instead of on the supplier of the money, then it seems like money does not come or seems hard to come by. Here in the story we're going to read today, uh, a man was focused on the provision so much, but in spite of his focus being off, he was supernaturally introduced to the provider of all provision. And so I've used this story I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. I've used this story in, in my healing school lessons, but also it relates to a provision-minded individual. So let's see what we can gain from the scriptures today. Looking here at Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. God bless you. Okay, so uh, what we want to see here is that in Acts 3, verse 4, uh, I want to focus on this portion of this passage. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Amen. Okay. So now that we see that, now that we understand that, what we want to look at is some things about being provision-minded versus provider-minded. Sometimes our expect, expectation in a time of need uh, can be a total focus on someone to provide for us or even upon God for the provision and overlooking that he is greater than the provision. Now, follow with me. Don't, don't let this become a point of confusion for you, but follow with me and hear what I have to say today. Our God is our provider. Did you know, whatever country you're watching me from today, that God is your provider? God doesn't bless the USA more than he blesses some other country. He blesses people. In the old covenant, there may have been a provision-minded a um, uh, situation where they looked at how or who God provided for. But in the new covenant, what we see is that God is a provider. 
Now you can focus on the provision till the provision almost becomes a point of worship or becomes your idol. Got to have the provision. Got to, and you will even pray in ways that very religiously and saying, "God, you've got to do this for me. God, if you don't do this, how am I going to make it?" And ministers and ministries pray that way a lot of times because we've done big things and we aren't able to pay for them. And it doesn't seem like there's going to be any provision. Well, sometimes it's simply because we're so focused on the provision, we're overlooking something very important. So what if we come to into a complete understanding that when we focus on provision, the provision becomes an idol to some degree, and we no longer are focusing on what the provider did in the finished work of Jesus. Just know this, that it, this is not a word of condemnation, but a word of encouragement about keeping your focus on Jesus during a time of need. You know, folks, I'm aware that when you're in a great time of need, you're hard pressed, you're up against a wall, as it would seem. And all you can see is how big the need is. But in those times, are when we need to be focused on how big our God is, because even in those times, our God is greater than the need that you're going through. Amen. So I want to take you through some scriptures this morning, and I want to show you how that we can be focused on the provider of the provision and not the provision. Amen. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but we're going to talk about this this morning. So we're going to first look at uh, the scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. I've taken this out of a passage that here we talk about finances. So the fact that we're talking about finances means then that uh, God has a word for you concerning finances. Amen? Okay, so let's look at this today. First, second, for 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Folks, I'm a, I know that you are aware today that Jesus did not have to come into this earth realm and sacrifice his life and die for his benefit. No, it was completely for our benefit. It wasn't something that he would just got up one morning and said, you know, Father, I need to come into the earth realm and I need to, to die this horrible death. I need to do that. It's just something I got to do, Father. No, he didn't do that. He did it because of you. And so when you think about this verse of scripture, uh, I want to read it from a few different translations before we talk a lot about it. But in the Living Bible, it says, you know how full of love and kindness our Lord Jesus was, though he was so very rich, yet to help you, he became so very poor, so that by being poor, he could make you rich. Now, a lot of people take that and they apply that to spiritual. Oh, yes, I'm spiritually rich. That don't help me much here in this life, but I'm spiritually rich. You know, being spiritually rich is exactly right. It doesn't help you much in this life. So there must be another meaning to this verse. Looking at the same verse from the Message Bible, it says, You are familiar with the generosity of our Master, Jesus Christ. He was... Um, uh, uh, rich as he was, he gave it all away for us. In one stroke, he became poor so that we became, we became rich. And then finally, from the Amplified Bible, it says, For you are recognizing more clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing kindness, his generosity, his gracious favor, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich, abundantly blessed. Now, here's the thing. If Jesus did all of this for you, then why do you believe that you must focus on the need or lack that you have instead of remaining focused on how much your father loves you? I mean, the reality is, as we look at these words, and I'm going to show you uh, uh, one of the words here in just a moment, but we look at these words from the original Greek, and what we're understanding is that Jesus did not have to give up anything, but he came and gave up all for you. Are you hearing me today? 
He gave up all for you, even to the point, remember, that when he was going to the cross, they took his garments and they, they gambled them away. The soldiers did. All he left had left, as we understand it, on the cross was a loincloth. You know what a loincloth is? Kind of like something like Tarzan would wear, a loincloth. That's all Jesus had. They gambled his clothes away. He literally came to a new level, and I'm going to tell you about that. He became for, for, the, for one purpose, and that was so you could experience that provision that you need in life. The word rich here, because a lot of people have an issue with this word rich. They think rich, again, is only spiritually. But think about it. The word rich used here in our English Bibles comes from the Greek word plusios, 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 which means wealthy or figuratively abounding with wealth. So the reality is, is God became, Jesus uh, became poor. Jesus, think about it. Jesus became poor. Jesus, actually the Greek here says that he came, he allowed himself to be lowered to the level of a beggar, even though he did not beg. I want you to hear this because a lot of people beg for money today. Ministers beg for money today. I like to put out advertisements and say, hey, we work from home. We need a building. If you want to give, you can give. Uh, I don't even mind sharing details sometimes. But what I believe is, is that here's, the, here's an opportunity. If you want to give, give. But we don't need to lay the pressure on so thick that we turn people away. So the reality is, is that Jesus became at the level of a beggar, but he did not beg. So that we, through his humility, this humble act, might partake in the riches of heaven. Again, the word rich is there, or to be rich means wealthy. Now, I don't believe that you have to go around with, and I'll probably mention this a couple of times, that you have to have a bank account with a million dollars in it. Thank God if you're believing for a million dollars and you have a need for a million dollars, thank God for it. But the reality is, is what we need to do is believe God that our needs are per, per, are met based on our focus on the provider. And I'm going to talk a lot about the provider this morning. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, because there's something here I want to show you. Ephesians 1, verse 3. What this says is, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You might say blessed, but I call this word blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, not will, but has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Or this actually reads in the heavenly Christ. The word places here is italicized, and so you can actually remove that word and uh, in is uh, actually is uh, a, a Greek word, E-N, it could be in two. But blessed in the heavenly Christ. We have been blessed in the with the, every spiritual blessing. Now, we need to understand that God, when God created the heavens and the earth, uh, there was nothing, the earth was with, uh, and, and he spoke out of the spiritual realm and something manifested in the natural realm. That's a true concept of faith that we need to understand. The reality is, is that everything that is natural, from the trees that are around us, from the house you live in, to the clothes you wear, everything around us is from the supernatural realm that manifests in the natural realm based on the spoken word. And so this same verse in the New Living Translation says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Do you see the transition here of wording that we're blessed in the heavenly realms? the supernatural realm, because of we're united with Christ, or in other words, from our union with Christ. This same verse in the Message Bible says, how blessed is God, and what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and he takes us to the high places of blessing in him. What a wonderful view, since all of these translations are translations from the original, but they're not the original. 
it's good to get a, a, a mixing of views of how words are, are used in various translations of the Bible. Uh, just like we see here, he takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Are you catching the theme here that all blessing is in him? All blessing is not for the sake of just getting blessing, just acquiring blessing, but all blessing is in him. So the reality is that God has chosen to bless you and he did it through Christ. Let me ask you this. Can you understand that if you believe that blessing came when Jesus died for you on the cross, it, that healing came when Jesus died for you on the cross, what are the uh, what is the fruit of his action? Well, the fruit is the healing and the blessing. But the action was the act of salvation. So salvation was also released at the cross over 2,000 years ago. And that salvation package, the Greek word sozo, which means healing, um, uh, 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 provision, um, uh, long life, um, uh, protection. I mean, there's a variety of things that were provided for you when Jesus died on the cross. Think about that. We, we call that your salvation package. So again, all provision comes through your union with Christ. Salvation is not a result of your union with Christ. And thank God for the manifestation of our salvation and for its benefits. But when you have a relationship, when you have understand that provision is based on your trusting your provider to provide, even when it looks like there is not provision coming at all. So the reality is that sometimes we get hung up on we get hung up on the provision without realizing, hey, there is a provider that loves us very, very much. Amen. And so that's why we focus on the provider. So uh, it would be like focusing on the benefits of God instead of focusing on God. Sometimes people just want what you have, but they don't really want the relationship. I've asked many people on Facebook. I, I, I accept their, their friend request, and I have two timelines, so I have a lot of friends out there. Uh, but I accept their friend request, and the first question out of their mouth is, will you give me money? Well, the reality is, is people are not as interested in relationships as they are what they can get out of the relationship. So I say that in reference to God. Are you interested only in what God can provide for you or what he can do for you? Or are you interested in the fact that he is your provider and there's something bigger that we need to see here? Okay, now we can see from how this man in Acts chapter 3 was lame from his birth. As a matter of fact, uh, my, my study of the history of this man shows me that he was probably in his 30s, and this man had never walked. He was always carried uh, places uh, wherever he went. And the Bible says that as Peter and John were going into the temple to pray at the ninth hour, which uh, seems to be about three o'clock in the afternoon uh, in our time, their eyes came upon this lame man in this story. And history tells us that it was a custom for the Jews to pray three times a day and at certain times of the day. And this was one of those times which, in which this man was laid outside the gates of the temple beautiful the, the, the outside the temple the gates beautiful uh and this man um uh the temple which is called beautiful and this man had an opportunity to collect alms as a means of his livelihood so what i'm saying to you about that is that um that this man made a living this was how he made a living he laid outside the temple and he begged for money. Now, remember what I said earlier. God is not a God of, of begging. He does not beg, okay? God does not beg. But God does, did become, in Christ, became or lowered himself to the level of a beggar. Okay, now, uh, verse uh, uh, Acts 3, verse 2 said, whom they, some of the family and friends, laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. The word beautiful here comes from the Greek word har harios, harios, um, uh, hurios. I I'm probably not pronouncing that exactly right, but, but here's what it means. It means belonging to the right hour or season. Now, I know what you're thinking, that everybody has their season, 
uh, when God will bless them. But what I want you to understand is, is that that the moment you get a revelation of the finished work, that is your season. That is your moment. That's when everything should come into an alignment. Uh, the word beautiful uh, is a powerful word. And, and I just want to say in relationship to your, your, your time or your season, uh, that the way you determine when the right hour or season comes for you is when you believe in what Jesus has done for you. In other words, when you believe what Jesus did for you as done, as finished, as completed. Some people are still waiting for Jesus to do something. Some people are waiting for God to provide for them, for God to heal them. Someday healing will come. Someday provision will come. Well, as long as you have provision, uh, a provision mindedness about you, I think it really could be that you may wait a long time until you become provider minded. So what, what you believe comes into an alignment or an agreement with the finished work of Jesus, or in other words, when your believing touches the sacrifice of Jesus, which connects you back 2,000 years ago to when stripes were laid on the back of Jesus, or in other words, when the sacrifice of Jesus took place. Too many people today are will still say, when God heals me, or if God would hurry up and heal me. Or they might say, when God blesses me, or if God would bless me, someday God might bless me. But here's the, the thing. It, 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 that, that same is true about a provision-minded person. But it, the reality is this, that it is important to connect your believing to the truth or the reality of the cross. One, uh, our believing must be the connecting force between the sacrifice of Jesus and the future tense place of your body, your mind, or your situation that you're experiencing at that moment. This very mo uh, moment became this man's appointed hour or season for his healing. Well, we could say that the same thing is true of your provision, that the moment you believe that what Jesus did is done. Are you hearing me? is done at that moment is when the provision will manifest now you say dr bill have you ever waited for provision absolutely but the thing is, is that we need to be a people who are not focused on the provision but on the provider now i want to look at a verse of scripture that speaks loudly to those who are always giving up during a time of need I understand that I'm not doing a series like teaching because I the webinar thing might be fixed next week and we might be going back with a guest. But here, here is something that is a key element in what many times can hinder you from gaining what belongs to you or keeping it, which is fear. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, we know this is an Old Testament scripture, but it has a new covenant application for us. Uh, this would imply that those whose minds or thoughts are stayed on you, which is the Greek word samak, meaning to lean upon or take hold of. I want you to focus on that phrase for a moment, because even in the Old Testament, this is not God taking hold of you, but you taking hold of him. Understand how salvation works. Think about this a moment. What Jesus did was he was willing to be sacrificed. He was willing to face sacrifice so that you could have the benefit or the fruit of that. Now, I want you to think about it this way. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus dies one time permanently for all mankind, not just for you, but for all mankind, not just for Christians, but for Muslims, for Jews, for Gentiles, for all kinds of people. He died one time. And in his death, I want you to think about this, in his dying, in this one sacrifice, it was as if God were reaching his hand out to humanity through the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Don't you think that it's sensible for mankind just to reach back to touch the finished work of Jesus? You say, but Dr. Bill, not all people have done that yet. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I, I get it that all people haven't done that yet. But the reality is, is that 
All people can do that. And I have faith that God is doing something today, trying to reach everyone in this world, trying to get the attention of folks. And the fact is this, that even in this Old Testament verse, again, it's not God reaching out or taking hold of you. It is you taking hold of him. So it's just like the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, verse 26, who is your helper, and he will help you, but you have to do the taking hold of. Look at the Greek definition there from Romans 8, 26. Okay, now back to Isaiah 26, 3. I want to read this to you from the God's Word translation. It says, with perfect peace, you will protect those whose minds cannot be changed because they trust you. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about what we started out talking about, and that's a mindset, okay? Do you have a mindset of provision, or do you have a mindset that is focused on the provider? Are you looking at your need, or are you looking at the one who is the answer? It's not about Jesus has the answer, but he is the answer. So instead of focusing on how bad life is, or how great a need you have, or how difficult your situation is, this might be not only a financial situation, but it might be a physical situation. You know, there are some folks who still haven't made up their mind that God wants you healed and whole, 100%. The reality is, is that just because God wants you healed and whole doesn't mean you believe you're supposed to be healed and whole. Well, the reality is, is that also that God wants you blessed. God wants all your need met, no lack, nothing lacking, nothing broken, nothing missing. That's how God sees you. But the problem with that is we don't often see ourselves that way, okay? So the reality is, is that God is a provider. And so we have an opportunity to focus on the provider, but too often we're distracted from the provider because of the provision. All right, so God, uh, he will, uh, he will, uh, uh, with perfect peace, you will protect those whose minds cannot be changed because they trust you. So we cannot allow fear to take hold of our hearts. You can't allow fear to take hold of your mind. Your heart and your mind are, are uh, two interchangeable words in the Greek language. They basically mean the same thing. One comes from the other. Uh, but once your heart or mind is made up to the fact that you are healed because God said so, or that you are blessed because God said so, then the provision has no choice but to manifest. The problem is, as we get in this mode, I'm believing for the provision. I'm believing for the provision. Thank you, Lord, for the provision. All, and I'm not against thanking God for things. I'm not against, I think there's a place for that. But we become so focused on the provision that we forget that we actually can have an intimate relationship with the provider. And out of that intimacy comes the provision of all things. So the only thing that can hinder you from your manifestation is fear, which becomes a distraction to uh, to you to take your focus off of the provider who provi who provides the provision. F faith, uh, fear is a uh, is a lack of confidence that God will do exactly what His Word said He would do. Uh, so I, I just want to thank God for. Uh, him being a provider, that you can trust him as your provider. Provision is not of you, but it is, is of God. Therefore, everything you can do to apply thought to the situation does not change it. So therefore, wouldn't it make more sense to just enter into this intimate fellowship with your provider? Amen. Sometimes people still think that they have been sick so long or broke so long that their soul now tells them that they will always have symptoms of pain or lack even tomorrow. This is only because they have been accustomed to having pain in their body or lack in their bank account, and they feel like they cannot live any other way. But that is not the Father's plan for your life. Folks, I'm not telling you anything new. I'm sorry if you live in a third world country that has tremendous amount of lack because of a, a government that does not live for Jesus. But listen to me, if you live for Jesus, that in reality is powerful enough, amen? So you live for Jesus because you love Jesus, because Jesus loves you, not because of the kind of country you live in, okay? So we're not talking about something that is dominant to one nation or another. We're talking about something that belongs to all mankind just because God said so. So just like the lame man in Acts chapter 3, 
he was determined to get what he had coming to him. He believed that he should receive something more than what he had before he arrived there at that moment. Uh, the Bible says in, in Acts chapter 3, verse uh, 6 and 7, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Uh, I do not have, but, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, although this man, and I'm about to close this morning, but I want you to get this. Although this man in this story had to do with healing, you have arrived at life today. You got up this morning, okay? You woke up this morning. You have now have an opportunity. A opportunity is facing you right now. And that has to do with the question I want to ask you, what is your expectancy level right now? The bottom line is that Jesus, who is rich, allowed himself to fall to the level of a beggar so that he could touch the lower levels of where humanity was. Think about that. And it was at that moment that God met this lame man and a miracle happened just because his expectancy met the finished work of Jesus. What does the finished work of Jesus portray? It portrays a mighty work of God that is complete, does it not? So that means that salvation was complete. That means that provision was complete. That means that healing was complete. That protection was complete. In other words, all the bases are covered. God didn't miss a thing. Everything was complete in the finished work of Jesus. The question is, is that are you, do you believe in the finished work in terms of that it is finished? It's done. Since it is the faith of God working in you, that becomes the breeding ground for your miracle. Now think about this. Most people believe that we have faith. Some people have strong faith. Some people have weak faith. Some people have no faith. We get that from reading what our English Bible says. And oftentimes, for example, when Jesus was on the water with the disciples and said to them, why is it that you have no faith? That doesn't read that way in the original language. It reads, why is it that you're not exercising faith? When the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. That reads completely different in the Greek language. It reads, without exercising faith that is impossible to fully agree with God. So here's what I want to say to you. The faith of God is what Paul said he lives by. But the faith we live by is really the thing we're persuaded of. It's our belief system. So what are you persuaded of? Are you persuaded that your father has provided for you that the provision of the finished work of Jesus belongs to you? Or are you still trying to get the provision? Because as long as you're trying to get the provision, you're never going to get there. Okay? If you do, it'll be by the grace of God. So the fact is, are you looking for or to the provision or are you looking to the provider? Are you focused on what God might do or could do for you or what he has given you through the finished work of his son? Faith is the breeding ground for miracles. Amen. The provision already belongs to you. Hear these last few words that I'm going to speak to you this morning. The provision already belongs to you. But the way you take hold of it is through your fellowship and relationship with the provider. Now that you've come to Christ, now that Jesus has finished his work, you're related, okay? You're related even if you never speak to God for the, your whole life, you're related. I know that's tough for some people to swallow, but you are related to God. He's your creator. Whether you're what people call born again or not born again, you're related to God. So here's the reality. You may never fellowship with him, but when you begin to fellowship with him and you begin to encounter intimacy with the Lord, out of that comes manifestations of provision. You must develop a mindset that says, you are blessed because God said so. Therefore, at the same time, we've got to shed the thinking that says we're poor and we're striving to get blessed someday. 
No, look, I still believe in miracles. I believe there are people who are dealing with lack right now that I'm talking to that need a miracle in their finances. I believe there are miracle that miracles waiting for people who will stop seeking the provision and start looking to the provider. Miracles are based on expectancy, which is rooted in the provision only found in the finished work of Jesus, or we could say only found in the provider. Jesus is the provider of the provision. But you can look to the fruit of what he did or what he has for you, or you can look to him and all things flow out of that fellowship. Amen. I hope you got this message and I'd like you to take this message and study it uh, and, and teach it yourself because uh, the video will be available. It's on Facebook. I will be loading it to YouTube and then posting it to Facebook, uh, to all of my sites uh, later on. But the reality is, is that God is your provider. And I want to just say right now, Jehovah Jireh of the Old Testament, your provider, my provider, you need a miracle right now. And I just pray, Father God, open up the understanding of your people. Open up their understanding so that they quit looking to the provider. I need, I need, I need, I need. That's one of the things we get on to our children for when they're growing up. The I need, I need, I need idea. And we try them to look to us and to trust us that we will take care of them. Well, don't you think Father God, that he, that idea came from Father God, that he wants you to stop doing the I need, I need, I need. I'm not saying don't ask him for anything, but, you know, he wants you to look to him and trust him to provide for you just because of his love. Get a revelation of his love. Father God, I pray that you'd open the eyes of the understanding of my brothers and sisters today who are in great need of a miracle right now. And as they look to you as their provider, thank you, Father God, that even today, miracles will flow out of that fellowship. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope you will click like and then share with your friends because everybody needs to hear about how we need to focus on the provider of all provision. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. And I will see you next week on another show. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Bye-bye.